we'll get moving with a feature presentation. Uh, tonight I'm very pleased to welcome back for a, a couple times ago, uh, Ron Lesher. And it was in 1957 that a friend of Ron's family introduced him to revenue stamps and recalling how he visited industry sites in Reading and Pennsylvania, removed tax pay and paid stamps from drums of alcohol, stamps that remain unlisted in Scott's specialized catalog today. And these relatively obscure federal and state revenue stamps have become the mainstay of Ron's collecting interests, as we will see tonight. Uh, but it was Ron's introduction to the late Ernest Wilkins that turned him on to exploring the back of the book on revenue stamps, especially leading him into writing and researching uh, the unexplored nooks and crannies, which eventually became the principal focus of his exhibiting and writing. Two explorations stand out first, uh, the discovery of the real use of tax worm revenues that led to an article in 1990, the American Philatelic Congress yearbook, correcting the fantastic and inaccurate stories of the tapeworms written by Herman Hurst. Uh, second was the combing of the records in the attic of the annex of the Bureau of Engraving, uh, Engraving and Printing led to another American Philatelic Congress article in 2006, showing the chronological order of the uh, straight lock seals. Uh, the research led to the realization that some of the lock seals were thought to be essays were actually issued and used. Uh, along the way, through a series of articles in the American Revenuer under the pseudonym uh, Ben Check and a column in the Midwest uh, Stamp Collector under another pseudonym. This is Roscoe Irwin, a name stolen from the 14th District of the New York Collector of Internal Revenue, who produced a series of surcharges on federal beer stamps in 1914. Uh, throughout these years uh, Ron, of his Ron's research, the articles have appeared concurrently in State Revenue News, uh, perhaps the most satisfying series of articles that he has done has appeared in almost every issue of the American Stamp Dealer and Collector, revealing many rewarding uh, backstories in state and federal revenues. So, as I said, Ron's a regular member of our societies and winner of many awards uh, for a scholarship and other contributions. So please join me in, in offering Ron a, well, uh, a warm welcome back to PLC. And Ron, if you can get two minutes before we, we leave tonight, I'm interested in just what a tapeworm revenue is. So we can, if we can do that, in. but for everybody else, if you could uh, uh, mute and we'll turn it over to Ron. I've retitled this, I've, I've made this presentation a number of times previously. Uh, I'm a graduate of Lafayette College in Eastern Pennsylvania. And one of the professors up there during COVID did a presentation on a book he wrote entitled Pure Adulteration. Now he's, a, uh, he's an engineer and he's, he's interested in environmental issues. And uh, he wrote this book entitled Pure Adulteration. The, the subtitle is Cheating on Nature, on Nature in the Age of Manufactured Food. And so I've I've changed my presentation's title to to uh, use that same title, pure adulteration. And and within the last week, um, I was uh, listening to a presentation at the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, and and it was some food uh, product uh, that uh, they were describing, and one of the ingredients was sawdust. Uh, I haven't seen that recently in, in my shopping in the local stores, but uh, uh, that was something that became a great concern in the late 1800s. And that's really the subject uh, tonight on, on how the government decided that they were going to uh, uh, discourage that through taxation, through uh, listing of ingredients, and it and it and eventually leads to uh, under the leadership of Harvey Wiley, a chemist, uh, in 1906 to the Pure Food and Drug Law, and we've we've most of us have lived uh, throughout our lifetime with a great deal of concern about uh, the Pure Food and Drug Law. So let's uh, let's start. This is an illustration uh, that I found. Uh, um, it's from the 1890s and it's talking about fraud. Uh, while this is not gonna be this, my subject, uh, uh, cottonseed or olive oil uh, imported from Europe 
was often uh, uh, mixed with cottonseed oil, uh, but nobody nobody uh, would admit that they had added uh, cottonseed oil, but they charged the full price for pure uh, olive oil. And uh, oleomargarine is part of that story. And as we will see a little bit later in my presentation, uh, uh, even lard was imitated. Okay. So what's going on here? In 1886, can you believe it? In 1886, Congress passed a law regulating the manufacture of oleomargarine. Uh, they defined what oleomargarine is. Um, and I dare, I challenge every one of you to go, the next time you're shopping, try and buy oleomargarine uh, or a product that calls itself oleomargarine in the stores today. I dare say you are not going to find that because in 1886, they wanted everything to that was manufactured, uh, manufactured foods to be as close to the natural product. And therefore the, the legal definition of oleomargarine is that it must have the same fat content as butter. And that's why you aren't going to find it anymore in the stores. Um, uh, I remember in the 1970s when we became concerned about fats in our food, uh, Fleischmann manufactured, uh, was selling something called imitation oleomargarine. How about that? An imitation of the imitation. And it, the reason they had to say that was because it was the first time I had found something that was uh, like oleomargarine, but it didn't meet the legal definition because it didn't have the same fat content. Uh, okay, back to 1886. The first thing they did was they, in, in their act, was that they required every manufacturer of oleomargarine to register annually and pay an annual tax of $600. And that lasted from 1886 until 19, until June 30th, 1950. And the, 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 uh, the amount of that tax, that annual tax as a manufacturer never changed in that entire period of time. So you can imagine that $600 in 1886 was a, a very, very sizable amount of money. In addition to that, every, every carton of, uh, of oleomargarine had to have this label on it. It is called a Form 219 label. Uh, it even specified the size of the word oleomargarine. It had to indicate where it was manufacturer and in which internal revenue district that it was manufactured. And this was all regulated by the Department of Agriculture. And we can see here, this is establishment number 413. In 1886, oleomargarine was manufactured uh, from animal fats. By 1910, 1915, by World War I, uh, many of the manufacturers were no longer using animal fats and had moved to vegetable oils uh, and uh, uh, using that as the basis of oleomargarine. But again, the, the motivation in the 1880s was to use every part of the animal uh, in the slaughterhouses and uh, the fats that they didn't wish to sell directly, uh, they made oleomargarine from it. Okay, here is a, an oleomargarine stamp the tax was four cents per pound. Uh, this was used in 1889, so it's just a few years after the beginning. Uh, oleomargarine at that time was shipped out in firkins or barrels, and almost invariably you will find that these were applied to those wooden, wooden barrels with nails, and so you will see uh, a number of holes in this stamp where the nails were used to nail it to the to the wooden uh, firkin. 
if you made oleomargarine and you wish to export it, it could be exported free of that tax. They didn't have to pay that four cent uh, per pound tax. This was a uh, something that developed along about this time where anything that was being exported, you didn't have to pay the tax. Uh, if you go back to the Civil War era, they actually had to pay the tax and then they had to apply for a, a, a refund on the taxes paid if they were going to export something that was, that was subject to taxes. And this, this was a way of uh, preserving the capital of uh, the manufacturers <coughs> and, and, and significantly cutting down on uh, uh, the amount of paperwork uh, that the government had to engage in in order to keep a record of what was paid and whether or not they had to refund it on, on ex and exporting of the product. Sorry. The dairy industry became concerned about oleomargarine, and most of the manufacturers of oleomargarine were adding some coloring to it to make it look as close as it could, as they could, to, to butter. And so they went on a campaign to raise funds. Uh, here are two of the buttons uh, representing a 50 cent contribution and a dollar contribution to the National Dairy Union. Um, and they were raising funds to lobby Congress to passing a law that uh, differentiated between uncolored margarine and colored margarine. And I'll talk a little bit further about that. Some of you uh, are suspect are old enough that you may remember uh, something about coloring of oleomargarine. Okay, they were successful. And so in 1904, uh, we have uh, other, these existed before too, but uh, we have other categories of wholesale dealers if the oleomargarine was colored, the, uh, the annual tax was $480. If you were manufacturing only uncolored margarine and you were a wholesaler, it only cost $200. Retail dealers in colored margarine had to pay an annual tax of $48, but if you were only dealing in uncolored margarine, it only cost you $6 to register. And that was, a, again, uh, $6 was an annual tax that retail dealers had to, uh, had to pay. Now, the irony in all of this, well, I'll talk about the, the amount of tax uh, on uncolored versus colored margarine. But the irony in all of this is that the dairy industry itself was using the same food coloring during the winter time when the cows were eating silage and not grazing in the meadow because when they made butter during the winter time, it was much paler in color. And so they were using the same dye, food dye, so that butter would appear to be the same color year round that the oleomargarine manufacturers were using to make it look closer to butter. But that's all right. It's okay for the dairy industry to use those food colorings, just not the uh, manufacturers of oleomargarine. Okay, 192. Uncolored margarine, the tax is reduced from four cents a pound to a quarter of a cent per pound. In other words, they're, they're removing the incentive. Uh, uh, we can, you can sell white oleomargarine uh, much cheaper than you can butter, but people aren't going to want to buy that because it doesn't look like butter. The, uh, the stamps that were issued, uh, uh, Again, we're still manufacturing, we're shipping it in, in wooden 
barrels or firkins, and the, the basic stamps are denominated in 10 pound intervals from, from uh, 10 pounds all the way up to, uh, I think the largest one that I've personally seen is a 60 pound, uh, but I believe they go all the way up to 100 pounds. And if, if, if it's in between, you cut off all the coupons there on the left side of the stamp to indicate so that this, this package, uh, this, uh, this uh, barrel of uh, oleomargarine was uh, 45 pounds. So in your local uh, neighborhood grocery store, you would go in and you would ask uh, the owner of the store to cut you some oleomargarine and they would probably wrap it in wax paper, weigh it and sell it to you that way. Uh, it wasn't prepackaged in containers as we're used to purchasing uh, table spreads today. Uh, in 1916, they, uh, uh, they, they were, there was a concern that it was costing too much to, to print the stamps. And so we go to a single color on the stamps. And this has some coupons attached, but those coupons were not part of the sheet of uh, uncolored oleomargarine stamps. Uh, those were in a separate sheet and you had to attach those. And it's, it's really quite uh, unusual to still find some of these uh, uh, little one pound coupons uh, attached to original stamps. <coughs> the tax on colored margarine, and by the way, the colored margarine stamps are quite scarce. Uh, the, the tax on colored margarine was 10 cents a pound, 40 times what the tax on uncolored margarine was. And at least in 1902, when this was, when these tax rates were uh, set, that brought margarine up to, a uh, colored margarine up to the price of butter. So there was no incentive to save money by purchasing colored margarine. You'd have to, if you wanted to save money, you uh, you purchased uncolored margarine. Now, before I go further in this, I'm kind of curious. Well, you can answer me a little bit later when after after my presentation. But I remember uh, as a as a young boy in the late 1940s, uh, my family purchased oleo margarine, and it came in a clear plastic bag. And there was a bead of color on the inside of the bag that I was delighted to break and then massage the, the clear plastic bag to distribute that color so that it looked much like butter. Uh, and this was the way the manufacturers decided that they would make it easy for the consumer to color the margarine themselves to make it much look, look like butter, the same color as butter, but uh, but when they sold it, it was uncolored, so they only had to pay the quarter cent per pound tax. Very clever of our manufacturers. And it, to the best of my knowledge, that only occurs after uh, World War II, and uh, the tax on oleo margarine completely disappears June 30th, 1950. Okay. In 1926, they reduced the size of the stamps further. And by this time, um, they are in sizes that uh, correspond to uh, cartons of prepackaged oleomargarine. This would have been a carton of 12 one pound packages of oleomargarine. This is the series of 1926. Uh, and again, this is colored oleomargarine. 10 cents per pound. So this, this, the tax that this stamp represents is a dollar and 20 cents. Okay. And by the way, the, the uncolored stamps, uh, similar to that, uh, 1926. And then there's a series of 1930, uh, the, the uncolored oleo margarine are black stamps, but the colored ones are nice and orange. Okay. Now, the federal government was not the only person that became concerned about uh, uh, oleomargarine and, and establishing taxes on oleomargarine. Two states, Georgia and Kansas, 
also established a tax on oleo margin, but only if it was manufactured from oils that were brought into the state from another state. In other words, they were trying to protect the in-state industries. And so this, this, neither one of these stamps have I ever actually seen a used one. Most of them have gum on them and they were obviously unused. Um, stamp collectors obviously wrote to the state to get examples of these. Uh, but I think both Georgia and, and Kansas were pretty successful in keeping uh, 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 oleomargarine that was manufactured from oils uh, out from outside the state. And here's an example of a carton. Uh, it was sold in Iowa. And we see the, uh, the 1931 uh, uncolored oleomargarine. This would have been 12 pounds and we see the state of Iowa. Now that 12 pound federal tax, a quarter cent per pound represents three cents of tax, but the state of Iowa collected 60 cents in tax on that carton of oil margarine. And again, I suspect this was uh, to aid the, uh, uh, that part of the dairy industry uh, that was in the state of Iowa or, or, or surrounding it, but it, essentially to protect uh, 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 give an advantage to uh, uh, the dairy industry. Kentucky, in the 1920s, um, placed a tax on oleomargarine, 10 cents per pound, substantial tax. Um, and this one got tested because apparently nobody was uh, the... Uh, uh, they tested this on the basis of interstate commerce and the out-of-state manufacturers of oleomargarine were successful in getting all the way to uh, the Supreme Court and getting this tax declared unconstitutional on the basis of its being a restraint of interstate commerce. <coughs> You'll notice that this has some perforated initials in it. Uh, KTC, which stands for the Kentucky Tax Commission. Here's another case stamp that resembles the Iowa. This is the Minnesota case stamp, 12 pounds. And again, they were, they were taxing it at 10 cents per pound. I don't know what the, 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 uh, the motivation behind this stamp, but the state of South Dakota didn't use the term oleomargarine. They used butter substitute, whether that was because uh, somebody was beginning to manufacture something of a, of perhaps of a uh, less fat content. But again, this dates back to the, uh, to the 1930s. And, and I don't think uh, anybody was doing that at that time. But in any case, this is a, butter substitute tax as opposed to all those others which have the word oleomargarine on them. South Dakota also taxed something called lard substitute tax. Uh, I think we can probably all think about what this might have been used on. How about Crisco, which is used as a substitute for uh, lard. Mm -hmm. Tennessee got into the act of taxing oleomargarine. Utah first stamps were uh, were supposed to be placed on each separate package. I think the uh, the the retailers objected to this. And so here we see a block of, uh, what is it, uh, 36? No, it's a, a, a 30, <laughs> a block of 30. And so this would have been placed on a case of a 30 pound with 31 pound boxes of uh, oleomargarine on it. Uh, that was uh, probably too expensive to, to continue this uh, uh, use of these single stamps. And so, 
they very shortly replaced these with oh, something's going on here. Uh, what's going on? Oh, there we go. And this represents the first uh, stamp that uh, uh, Utah was uh, using for packages, uh, cartons of 24 pounds of oleomargarine. And so the stamps that they continued to use uh, in the 1940s and 1950s were, were based on the size of a, of a carton with packages inside that carton. Okay, the rest of my presentation will deal with some other products that are doing something similar. This next one is something called processed butter. And, and I've had to do a substantial amount of research to find out what processed butter was. Uh, it, it, like oleomargarine, they required a package label where it was manufactured. Again, the word process butter had to be put, had to be of a certain size. Uh, a manufacturer of process or renovated butter uh, had to again register like the oleomargarine manufacturers. Uh, they had to pay $50 per year. What is process or renovated butter? As we all know, butter is subject to becoming rancid. And what, what they could do rather than lose the butter was that they melted it down, extract, extracted the butter fat, which was not the part that was causing the rancidity. They discarded the rest of it and replaced it with milk solids and whipped it up again. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, this was never marketed in uh, retail stores uh, to us, but I think most of this was in large containers that were used in uh, uh, bakeries so that they could say, yes, we're using butter, but they could purchase renovated butter. The original term was renovated butter. Here's the, here's the first. Uh, stamp. Again, this uh, was initiated in 1902. Uh, a beautiful, uh, artistically a beautiful stamp. Uh, uh, and it was called Renovated Butter. And uh, I don't know whether it was the public that, that decided uh, that that was a, uh, uh, a kind of a negative term or web, maybe it was the, uh, the marketers of this product that decided that that wasn't the way to uh, present it to the public. And so in 1907, the stamps, suddenly the word renovated disappeared and it now is simply called process butter. And I believe this uh, again was taxed at a relatively small rate uh, until, um, until 1950. And then I think all of this regulation uh, disappeared. The next product is something called filled cheese. What is filled? Anybody ever heard of filled cheese? Uh, I had never heard of it. And again, I had to do a substantial amount of research. This is something that is marketed as cheese, but it is not a dairy product. It is not made from milk. Uh, the original stamps were beautiful, engraved stamps, pictorial stamps, uh, like those renovated butter stamps. And no, no stamp collector that I know of has ever seen one of them. By the 1950s, they were looking for a cheaper way of producing these stamps. And by the way, they, they couldn't have been using very many of them at all. Uh, this is the series of 1952. It's a relatively simple thing. These stamps are not commonly found. In, 19, in, 
in the early 1970s, somebody writing for uh, in a newsletter of the uh, the American Heart Association said, "Why are you taxing this product? You're keeping it out of the marketplace by taxing it." There was also a requirement that at the end at the uh, at the entrance of every store that sold filled cheese, they had to sign, have to post a sign that said, filled cheese is sold here. Uh, very few manufacturers, very little retailing of this product, but you can find it in the store today, but no longer under the term filled cheese. By the way, the American Heart Association argued that why are you keeping it out of the marketplace? It's this thing that is not a natural dairy product, does not have contain cholesterol. And we should we should be encouraged, encouraging them to market this. It should be healthier for us. <coughs> Today it is marketed under the term vegan cheese. So it has no, no animal product. It's strictly uh, uh, plant-based. Uh, the stamps that we find today uh, most frequently in filled cheese are unused ones that were uh, uh, a large number of these, by the way, were uh, uh, disgorged from by the National Postal Museum about 15 years ago in a... Uh, in, in several uh, auctions, and uh, these are the stamps that most of us find in our stamp in our in our collections today. The one that was on the previous slide, which is a, uh, a genuinely used stamp, are are not very frequently encountered. One more product, mixed flour, and again. People were adding things to the flour to cheapen the flour, so, but they, they didn't include what the extra ingredients were. Uh, by 19, this, this occurs in 1898. Um, and by 1914, the, I've looked at some hearings in Congress and, and some of the menu, Congress is saying, you know, we're really not collecting much tax money on this. Uh, maybe we should get rid of it, and and uh, the better flour millers in our in our country said, "Oh no, you don't. We've got neighboring people who are manufacturing flour. They are mixing cornmeal with it, but they don't change the label on the package. They market it in the South with as flour." Now, the people that were doing that were still selling it for the price of wheat flour, even though it contained corn. And the defense of those people that were doing that were saying, oh, those people down south don't make any bread anyway. They make only cornbread. And this is perfectly good for making cornbread. They'd still add more cornmeal, but they were making much more money. Uh, much more profit on the flour that they were marketing in the South. And again, this leads to, you've got to own up to what the ingredients are. And again, that leads again to 196. But this, this, uh, this tax exists until uh, the middle of World War II. Here is uh, the first stamp. These are, these are typographed, first initiated in 1898. Uh, substantially, uh, uh, right after that, they uh, they uh, made an engraved, engraved stamp. Uh, by the way, this was uh, placed on barrels, half barrels, quarter barrels. Uh, I dare say most of us don't know how many pounds are in a barrel of mixed flour. I believe, if I remember correctly, it's 192 pounds. Uh, again, 1916, those big stamps are much more expensive to manufacture, and so they go to a smaller stamp. 
uh, finding used pairs, multiples is very, it is not very common. Uh, and this stamp uh, that we see here was, was in use all the way up until uh, the middle of World War II. Uh, a very scarce one barrel mixed flower stamp. Uh, I believe there are perhaps six or seven of these recorded in collector's hands. Uh, the quarter barrel, the, the half barrel, and the eighth barrel are, are fairly, uh, fairly readily obtained. Now, in doing all of this, I discovered, by the way, Harvey Wiley, 1956 stamp with Harvey Wiley. Harvey Wiley was a chemist and he becomes the architect of the pure food and drug law uh, that was passed in 1906. Uh, he was already uh, a chemist working for the agriculture department looking to inspect all these manufactured products. And I discovered that the state of Florida established the position of state chemist in 1889 because the same thing was going on with the manufacturer of fertilizer. And a little bit later, about 10 years, uh, about 15 years later, uh, they established a similar inspection program for animal feeds. And one can find, by the way, this the stamps that I'm showing you here from 1889 are are manufactured are printed from engraved plates. Uh, they're very well treasured by the uh, state revenue collectors. Later on, they went off went to lith lithography offset lithography for making these. But we we have all kinds of things that are that are being uh, inspected particularly in southern states, the, the big agricultural areas of our country, for fertilizer. Uh, this is for animal foods. This starts in 1905 in Florida. And even peat and humus. Our, our uh, people are adding things. Uh, that uh, inspection program is established in 1935 in Florida. A uh, lot of agricultural things that we don't think of as being associated with our foods, but uh, uh, people were adulterating them with cheaper things uh, like sawdust and such uh, uh, and, and not admitting to it. And so this notion of uh, listing all the ingredients and making sure that the manufacturers were being true to the what the ingredients said was an important uh, development in the regulation of uh, these manufacturers. I think that's it. Let's uh, see if there are any questions. A round of applause for our good friend Ron because he, there are a few things I haven't seen before, Ron. You always like to surprise us and uh, just to really appreciate that. Just, just phenomenal. Any, any open up for questions. I'll hold mine. You know, I got a couple, but I, I've got to open up to the floor. Any how, how many, how many of, how many of you folks that are heard this presentation remember the plastic, the clear plastic bags of oleo margarine that had the bead of color in? Uh, I've talked to many people who, yeah, I see some hands there. Uh, I, I, I've talked to a number of people who, uh, I was an only child, but uh, in families that had more than one child there was often a great amount of competition as to who would get to break that bead of color and massage it so that the, uh, the coloring got dis evenly distributed uh, throughout the oleo margarine. Yep. Other questions? My, my wife was just saying that uh, those were banned in Wisconsin. Uh, yes, the absolutely. absolutely. We, we lived out there and uh, a lady was telling us uh, doing that as a kid. And then yes, there, there was uh, often there were often expeditions to drive down to Illinois to buy oleo margarine and sneak it back across the border into uh, uh, Wisconsin. There, there's a big move to bring in, I guess, it would be the processed cheese uh, on 
frozen pizzas going into Wisconsin. And again, <laughs> civil war broke out. Too many dairy cattle. A question, I, not a question, just a statement. Uh, a friend of mine years ago was telling me, he, just a guy full of facts in his head, but that there was a standard amount of rat feces that was allowed in black pepper. Mm. And they, they would test it. And anything above that would get thrown at. Anything below it was okay. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and th I think this was that. This was occurring in the, uh, in the 80s. So, wow. I guess there's really nothing they could do about it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you have a wonderful collection of stamps that brought money to the Internal Revenue Service in the 1800s, late 1800s. So they've been getting us up for a long time, haven't they? <laughs> for a lot of things. Yes. It all started in the Civil War with playing cards and, right, proprietaries, right, medicines, matches, all that good stuff, right, Ron, with canned, the canned fruit, all that good stuff, right? Yeah, well, we, we certainly have that returning in, in the uh, Civil War era, uh, but we have, we have earlier precedents, the 1790s. Yes. Um, the 1790s, oh. uh, of course, we know of Alexander Hamilton. We all remember the Whiskey Rebellion because... Hamilton convinced Congress to uh, extend the import tax to domestically uh, produced distilled spirits. That led to the uh, uh, Whiskey Rebellion. But look, few of us, before we started looking at that period of time, recognized that uh, there were other taxes in the 1790s that were established by Hamilton and his successors, such as if you owned a carriage for the conveyance of people, not farm wagons, carriages, uh, were taxed beginning, I believe, in 1795. There is a, a direct tax in which uh, the Treasury Department uh, assessed each state, and the states had to collect that money, and it was done only to property owners, uh, we also have a documentary tax that is established in uh, 1798. And of course, Jefferson comes in in 1802 and immediately eliminates into all internal taxes. But they come back again in the War of 1812, beginning 1814, actually. And one of the interesting taxes that I have a receipt for is for a either a gold watch or a silver watch. Now, can you imagine that has nothing to do with the grandfather's clock or the grandmother's clock? It's a watch. Why would a watch be considered something that should be taxed? Well, it's a luxury. luxury. Nobody needs a watch. If you live in a town, there's the courthouse and there's always a clock there. And so that's all you need. And you have a you have a clock in your home, but you don't need a watch. Farmers don't need a watch. They get up when the sun comes up, and they go to bed when the sun goes down. I've looked up the person who paid this tax. He was a ship's captain, and he needed a watch for navigation. That tax comes back again during the Civil War as well. So and so does the the, the uh, tax on carriages, uh, federal tax. <coughs> okay, other comments. Ron, some of the stamps you had had a factory number, a place to note a factory number, and the name of a district. What was the significance of those? Uh, when they registered, Internal Revenue gave them a manufacturing number. A, 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 a factory number and and the district is it again was set up during the civil war uh i don't remember how many districts there were throughout the country uh uh in the in the uh introduction uh it is mentioned that i've written under the pseudonym of roscoe Irwin. he was the 14th district of new york that there were more than 14 districts in new york as well as in pennsylvania and many states uh, many of those got consolidated relatively quickly. They had to hire too many people to maintain all of these offices. Um, 
and and eventually in uh, following prohibition, it's reduced to 60 some in the country. <coughs> And then in 1953, it's reduced to nine regions. And so there's a great amount of consolidation of those, but uh, they kept the district numbers until certainly uh, uh, sometime in the 19th, the original district numbers. And so there, uh, the 23rd district in Pennsylvania, for example, is common on uh, uh, bonded where uh, bonded warehouses because that's the Pittsburgh area and they were all making Monongahela rye whiskey out there. Uh, the first district is Philadelphia and we see that in uh, uh, the narcotic stamps because Philadelphia is one of the centers for the manufacture of uh, uh, drugs and uh, particularly narcotic preparations. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, District 2 of New York is Lower Manhattan. District 3 is Brooklyn, and so on. I mean, and uh, those those get kept were maintained for a for a long time. Yeah, but again, they're they're required because if some somebody finds something wrong with this, they want to know who manufactured it, and they're going to go jump on them. Yep, like Good in question. modern you know modern medical products. They'll have like a code number on it so they can trace it. Yes. You know, if, something, if something goes wrong. And in the hospital, we were not allowed to use free samples because they didn't have these code numbers on them. Uh -huh. so somebody got sick instead of suing the drug company or the manufacturer that go after us. A uh, question uh, was, was I guess in a couple of parts, was butter taxed too? No. And why oleo? Uh, you know, I think, you know, sugar and some of those is because they were staples and everybody bought them. They'd get the biggest bang for the tax buck or. Well, I think the motivation is that they wanted to. Uh, there, there was a concern in the uh, in, in the later part of the 19th century for the public welfare, public health. And so they didn't want uh, this was really to prevent their uh, using. I'll go back to my example, sawdust uh, to uh, cheapen it or to uh, add uh, cottonseed oil to the olive oil and say, hey, this is pure olive oil imported from Italy. We're going to sell it all at the same price. Okay. Uh, and, and they wanted to make sure that uh, uh, you listed the ingredients and that you were faithful in listing those ingredients. And we see that all the way to the present time. And I think that's uh, that remains an ongoing concern. Good. I enjoyed your last stamp, Ron, because clearly proofreading was not at the top of their list. Because <laughs> spelling analysis with the I is yes. not, not even close because that's in Florida and they sure as got a heck got it right on the last one. So yeah. it just, I mean, these little things of, and I, I noticed who printed them too. We know the earlier ones were done by the BEP. I know in some of these in various states, they sort of utilize whatever bank no company they could in state or in New York. It really didn't matter, right? They were just that's, that's right. They just that's, sub to anybody they could sub to, right? To create these, right? Yeah, and and uh, uh, one of the one of the big printers now out of business, by the way, is Eureka uh, uh, up in uh, I believe it's Scranton, Pennsylvania, and and a lot of their uh, uh, files of uh, Things that they manufactured got uh, sold into the philatelic, eventually into the philatelic marketplace. And so we've got specimens and things just like the distribution of a lot of things from the American Banknote got, Company got uh, auctioned off a number of years ago. And we've got some really interesting things to add to our uh, collections as a result of that. Uh, but if you go out into some of the Western states, uh, uh, I know uh, one of the one of the big dealers uh, in the past uh, in state revenue stamps was a guy by the name of Albert Hubbard. That was not his real name. His real name was Amsler, but he adopted uh, the name Albert Hubbard. And and he went up to uh, the state of Oregon and and cleaned out uh, some stamps that were made in the 1930s. I don't know when he got them. It was probably in the 1940s sometime. And we've got. Uh, uh, we've got tons of these stamps, including some really wretched looking rejects uh, that were still uh, there in the files uh, and complete sheets. Uh, finding the genuinely used stamp are, is, is really quite unusual in this particular case. 
So there are all those sleuths that are going out there, right? It's the Lewis Robies of the world too, right? At that end oh, yes. of the last century, right? That went out there and searched every barn and nook and cranny to pull every single match and medicine stamp off of every single product that was still yep. out there, right? And so, yep. Yep. and he put his initials on the back of them, LR, right? And he yep. hand stamped them. So they're out there and you know, he had a piece of them, right? So, yeah. And and the story of Lewis Roby is, yeah. is further interesting because the, the pharmaceutical company he met, he worked for, he made sure that they got plenty of uh, uh, denominations, probably only one of which they actually used and the rest he sold as a stamp dealer. His uh, side business was as a stamp dealer. So, uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, I, I would agree. Yes, leave it at that. <laughs> but Ron, you know, we're all still looking for those original cartons and cases and packages and all that good stuff, right? <laughs> you mentioned the colored, right? Because uh, I've only come across one or two. The only one margarine that you showed that were orange, right? Was that the one, the 1886, right? This small is the uh, one that's harder to find than the 19, one. Well, the 192s are mm -hmm. exceedingly difficult to right. find. And even the one that I showed you from 1916 is not very common. The fact that it's got a couple of the plate numbers. Uh, I saw that at the upper left, the right? Top, it's yeah. This, yeah, yeah, two, three. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really a great piece. That's a great piece. Yeah. Ron, if it's possible, this my human curiosity, if you had a, a two-minute description of what the tapeworm revenues are. Oh, the tapeworm. Yeah. The tapeworm is a a large document, uh, it's, it's roughly eight and a half by 14. Uh, and it has, it was used in the clearing house in New York City. Uh, as you know, you can go into a bank and cash a check from another bank. And in the 1820s and 1830s, the cashiers of the bank would meet on the streets of New York City with lots of cash, they would say, here, I, you owe me so much because I cashed all of these checks from your bank and you need to pay me because I paid the, uh, my customer for them. For them. Uh, and, and so it was, uh, they established a clearing house in New York City, in lower Manhattan, in which each bank sent two people, and there was a, a an elliptical table where you put one person on the inside and somebody on the outside, and they would hand to the person on the inside an envelope with all the checks that they cashed, and they went around the table. There were <clears throat> fifty some banks originally. Uh, no, by the by the. Uh, uh, by the 1860s, uh, there were there were roughly uh, six. Let's let's say there were 60 banks, and within 10 minutes, they had exchanged all the checks. They went back to their bank. The clearinghouse decided that they would take all of the accounts, and in the afternoon, you would settle with one. You either got money or you gave money to the clearinghouse, and the clearinghouse distributed that money, and it was much more efficient. Well, this, this tapeworm had the names of all the banks, and on it, they listed how much money they, they were owed. And those are receipts, and during the Civil War era, each receipt was subject to a two cent tax. That meant this document had 60 receipts. So it had to have, you either had to put 60 two cent stamps on it, or you could have pre-printed a two cent stamp. And since these lines were close to each other, they only put the bottom part of the next stamp all the way down and it looks like a segmented series of stamps as if they were overlapped, but it was pre-printed by the American Phototype Company and they got the nickname, the Tapeworm Revenue. Mm -hmm. It I is listed it. in the Scott Specialized as RN, uh, it is type A, uh, nine and 10. There are two different lengths known. The, the first one is the shorter length 
used in 1865s between October 1st and the end of the calendar year. Uh, the longer ones are from 1867 and extend from January through June. They're far more common. Uh, and they are all from one bank. And we know that the tapeworms themselves were, were uh, printed for at least two other banks to save them the time of putting all those two cent stamps on them. Mm. And uh, this is the equivalent of uh, postal stationery, but it's revenue stationery. It's pre the, the stamps are pre-printed on there so they don't have to uh, put all the uh, adhesive stamps on. Nice, thank you, makes sense. Now, what, what I corrected was uh, Herman Hurst knew, by the way, that was at one time four different lengths known. Uh, I demonstrated that two of those lengths do not exist. Mm. Uh, so they got delisted from the Scott catalog as the result of that 1990 article. Uh, Herman Hurst said, the reason there are different lengths is that if they didn't use all of them, they just cut off there and started the next day with what remained. No, that's not true. Those documents are all complete documents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Herman, Herman Hurst wrote several times about the tapeworms. Each time it got a little bit more entertaining. Herman Hurst, remember, was a, was a great entertainer. And, he never uh, let the truth get in the way of a good philatelic story. That's, that's correct. <laughs> that's correct. Very good. Other questions, folks? Very, very good. Well, let's have another and thank you, Ron. Thank you, thank you Lily and Ron. And Very uh, good. please feel free to stay with us as we go to show and tell. And if you have anything okay. to add in, we'd, we'd love 